Here's Violet on the toll-free Toronto, Canada. Hi. Uh, hello. Good evening. Um, first of all, I would just like to comment that um, I feel very sorry for all the children that did perish in that horrible uh, blaze in Waco. But I would like to ask, Kiri, I understand that, um, well, first of all, I had been down there and I had seen firsthand what had happened after the blaze, and I've read a number of uh, books and articles about it. But I would like to know uh, from Kiri whether any of the children in that compound had ever been uh, trained in any of the weaponry that supposedly was on the premises or whether they had actually even seen any of this ammunition and weaponry that supposedly was there that everybody talks about. Well, I saw weapons myself. Um, I was supposed to go on the range and train with David Koresh, but I never got to go because something came up or something, I don't remember, but I did see guns, I saw plenty of them. I saw guns that were like as big as me with, with bullets that were huge. Um, so I don't, I don't know if, I, if any of the other kids saw them, but I saw them. And you, and you were supposed to go out and train with this stuff? Yeah. Were, were you not afraid for your own life at this point? Did that not trigger anything in your own mind that perhaps this was not normal for a child? I was seven years old. Seven at the time? seven and, or eight and he was training children as young as that well it wasn't like we could go out by ourselves and um train just for the heck of it there were adults around and um i didn't feel threatened they weren't going to hurt me well kiri my heart goes out for you i'm just glad that uh, you have gotten out of there safely I wish you all the best of luck in the future, and my heart goes out to every single child, every innocent child that perished in that horrendous uh, Waco disaster there. Thank you. Violet, I'm glad you called. Thanks for watching, and thank you for joining our program. Thank you very much, Tom. How do you feel about being a survivor? I, 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 I mean, are you, are you glad to be alive? Yeah. I have my whole life ahead of me. And as you watched this fire take place, I mean, you knew that those, your, your mom was in that building. Yeah. You knew that your mom was there. Mm-hmm. And was that okay? No, it wasn't okay. I was, I was upset. Um, I didn't show it, but I was upset. And you knew that there were innocent people there. Had, had you known that this was going to happen? Could you see this coming? Yeah. Day of the raid, I said to my dad, I said, none of them are coming out. They're not coming out. How did you know that? Um, I was an observant child. Uh, you could sense things. Um, David Crush would preach about the time when someone came and, and we were going to fight back and we were going to be killed. It was necessary to, to be martyred and then come back and uh, be raised incorruptible and destroy the earth. What are your thoughts on the raid? Uh, did the government do wrong here? Did the FBI do wrong? Alcohol, tobacco, and firearms? Janet Reno? These people, uh, people do wrong? You know, the Republicans in the Congress are trying to make a case that the government of the United States made this happen. I don't think anyone denies that there were mistakes made. They admit there were mistakes made. I think uh, the point is that uh, they believed, uh, because they believed that they had, you know, they had the warrant for the, the ammunition and the guns, and they knew that that was something that they could get him on, if you will. Uh, they knew about the charges of child abuse. They knew about uh, the, the charges of non-payment of taxes. They knew of um, many other charges or things that they suspected as well. But the only thing that they felt that they could get their hands on was the weapons. So that's why they went in as they did now. And, and something that I don't think people understand, Tom, is that, that while the government trained and prepared for this exercise for a period of weeks, David Koresh had spent his entire life preparing for this raid. He was far more ready than they were, and he had far more tricks up his sleeve than they did, and he was prepared to die to achieve his cause. You, you cannot prevail against an enemy that's prepared to die. How much talk of religion was there? Were, you, did, were there a lot of classes or speeches or lectures by David Koresh about God and religion and heaven and hell and things like that? Yeah, um, they would usually start around 10 at night mm -hmm. and go, I remember one time it went until like 11 o'clock in the morning the next day. 
Um, usually it would end around five, but I remember it went on for so long that one time. You say that as if you wish it hadn't gone on that long. I was tired. <laughs> it was hard. <laughs> and did David Koresh talk about the concept of, of, of heaven and hell and punishment for sin? Was, was that part of what he talked about at all? Yeah. Um, well, that the, if you did good, you would be rewarded. If you did evil, you would be punished. Was that part of his religion to you? Part of. Um, if you believed in him, you would be rewarded. If you didn't, you'd go to hell. If you believed in David Koresh or yeah. God, right? Well, all in one and the same. Okay. And do do you think David Koresh was God? In no. Any, no. And do you accept the premise that if you do good works, you are rewarded in heaven, and if you do evil, you burn in hell. Do you still now? you believe that now? I don't know. Did you believe it then? Yes. And based upon what you knew David Koresh had done, he beat men with paddles. We've heard your mother say that there's uh, uh, evidence that he abused women, uh, raped women. Uh, he certainly did things with you and other young women that are just unacceptable. Based upon that behavior, do you think that David Koresh is in heaven or hell? I don't. I, I, it's, it's not a fact of whether he's in heaven or hell. It's, to me, I, I have a really screwed up opinion of religion now. Um, it's whether he is anywhere. Um, to me, he could just be resting in peace. I mean, I don't, I don't know what happens life after death. I, I don't know. How do you feel about the fact that he is dead? Well, I'm pretty glad. Um, I, I, I couldn't have testified in front of Congress if he was there. Why? Oh, it would have, it, I, I just couldn't have done it. It would have been so scary. What would you be scared of? Just his eyes looking at me, I would have just died. Coming after you? No, well, no, I, I don't think coming after me. I, I, f I would have felt pretty safe, I think, but just knowing that he was sitting there looking at me. Ugh, it's it's extremely it's... intimidating. Well, oh, yes. yeah. How do you put it all back? I mean, as you sit here, you look like the normal all-American mom and dad and daughter. And in many ways, I hope you are that. Um, what, what brings you together? What keeps you together? What makes this past go away? The fact that Kiri is alive today yeah. is, is a testament to what a family can do when they love each other and are willing to pull together. You're talking tonight with Heather and Kiri and I and, and talking to Heather and I as if we were the ones who, who effected her rescue. And we were there and we were a part of it, but m our entire family gave their lives for a period of months, every single moment, every single ounce of strength until two and three o'clock in the morning to, to make happen what needed to happen to get Kiri here. Um, Mark and Elizabeth Bro in England are the, or excuse me, in Australia are the heroes. Victor McFadden, the attorney who gave his time and services for a cause that was virtually impossible, he's a hero. We just loved our daughter and she's alive today. I hope all is well that ends well and I hope that this happy ending continues and I thank you for your time and your candor and your courage in telling your story to the Congress and to sharing it with us tonight. Thank you, Kerry. Thank you, David. Thank you. And Heather, many thanks to you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Uh, my pleasure. We will continue and, uh, and lighten it up a little bit with uh, a little ride in a flying saucer after these messages. Tonight on The Late Show with David Letterman, Eddie Murphy, Michael Rappaport, and the music of John Hyatt. You know, boys and girls, we're the only show on television that's produced by a towel boy. You may not know all these people. You may not know all their stories. But Thursday night, watch The Young and the Restless after Murder, She Wrote, and you'll want to know it all. Once you've seen Thursday night, you'll never let another day go by. Thursday night. The automotive press has had lots of beautiful things to say about Hyundai's accent. But here's a quote you might find even more attractive. 7579. Oh, it's not that the words aren't flattering. It's just that for some, only money talks. And although the critics will no doubt continue to praise the accent for quite some time. The cash back could run out any day now. So of all the words you've heard so far, perhaps the most important are these last three. Uh, make that four.
it's time to find out what's coming up on George and Alana. Don't miss the madcap mayhem and mystifying marvels of the amazing Jonathan. Don't miss daytime darling Laura Lee Bell from The Young and the Restless with some information about YNR's special leap into primetime. And do not miss Grace Mirabella, whose life has been filled with the glamour of fashion, magazines, and high society. So mark your calendars on the next George and Alana. This morning at 9.